So we have about 10 minutes before we open up for responders. Um, this is the Q&A session. And so again, um, participants, um, the attendees are welcome to, to post questions in the Q&A box. Um, one comment that came up was um, that, that um, for those of you who presented, can, can you think about, or could you um, address what, um, from the research that you've done, do you see any way of, uh, what are the consequences of it? And do you see any way to, to try to address the problems that, that, you've, that you've raised? Um, and would all the presenters um, turn on your cameras, please? So how can this translate into action? I'm, I'm happy to jump in. Um, so my my organization is primarily a, uh, uh, we do data work with, within communities. So providing insights directly to those who are often affected by mobilization. Um, so one of the things that really informed even uh, starting this study was trying to figure out uh, when when things were just bluffing versus when things were actually likely to turn into something that could be violent or kinetic. Um, so the findings are like ones that we're directly implementing back into our own approaches and approaches that we uh, talk with our partners about. Um, so it's, yeah, it, I think it, it's a, uh, a good question um, and something that, uh, uh, like as practitioners, we're trying to be really sensitive to. I can jump in as well from my presentation. Um, one of the things w with a lot of the policy efforts that have been going on um, across the United States recently <clears throat> has been the attempt to try and use a singular educational rule to deal with children and students of all ages rather than looking at different age-appropriate ways to discuss um, parts of U.S. history and particularly um, U.S. experiences of different forms of extremist violence as well. And so one of the things that I'd like to see on a legislative front come through is more of an engagement with that detail and using more age-specific approaches to dealing with how um, different um, events can be talked with and discussed differently over different age frames um, while still engaging that um, there, there are a lot of negative consequences from these actions that go across generations um, as well as looking at how that can be sort of advanced over time with without being traumatic as well um, to children. So that's one thing policy-wise, getting more into the weeds, I think would be good for education for all, as well as engaging more directly with some of these extremist narratives that are used today to motivate violence. Yeah, and then in terms of our paper, um, it is attempting to be pretty direct, I think currently, um, and then also our additional steps are really hoping to look at um, the content of these bills that are being proposed, and then in turn, what is passing versus failing? Um, we've seen in some early analyses that states like Florida, which is on the news constantly with these anti-trans bills and things like that, aren't really proposing that many bills, but what they are proposing is getting passed. And then you have states like Texas, for example, um, also in the news all the time, that's kind of just throwing everything at the wall um, and nothing's really sticking with a lot of these bills. So they actually have fewer on the books, but more being proposed than most states. Um, so trying to disaggregate what's going on there, I think is one of the big next steps um, in what we're looking at beyond like, you know, who is just introducing these bills in general, if there's, you know, um, political strategy going on there and politicians are just seeing that, you know, having this on their record as proposing the bill is beneficial in conservative circles, or if they actually have to pass the bill and implement it um, to be successful in their political careers could have something to do with it. Um, but, you know, we're trying to have a more practical approach to like how these bills actually um, affect politics and in addition to the individuals they're targeting, so. Oh, and I think if the, everything that has been discussed has direct implications for protecting youth, right? So. Um, I guess our paper is just looking at ways to start the conversation about how all of these decisions and what's occurring nationally in terms of the spread of these kinds of ideologies and then racist rhetoric and their consequences on vulnerable youth. Um, 
as I mentioned, the extensions of the work would include other uh, psychiatric outcomes, other kinds of measures of you know how um, black youth face racism. Um, on the suicide prevention side, I am not fully sure what exactly can be done apart from extending resources for black youth uh, when they are undergoing these kinds of uh, you know exposures. Uh, legislature, uh, uh, legislative actions that in some way limit the spread of hate uh, following these events and uh, protect black youth and other youth from uh, repeatedly seeing these kinds of messages, uh, facing bullying online or in real life could be protective, I think. But um, I feel like more quantitative as well as qualitative work that dives deeper into what black youth undergo after these events have taken place or even living in a scenario where this has become mainstream uh, might might be the next direction. Um, I'd, I'd like to um, chime in on the last comment. I, I thought the lag of two months was really interesting because it does give um, a window for, for intervention, right? And so it, just like um, you know, when something happens on campus or in a community, counselors are available. But but it does it does signal that when something happens, if, if this was a result, if these findings were well publicized, it can signal to communities and to parents and to families to to work with their children um, on 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 the risks that they may be facing. Um, so Absolutely. instead of ignoring it and Absolutely. pushing it under the table. And this makes me think about how even within, you know, university systems, for example, in college campuses, the messages of support that go out, how fast they go out and, uh, you know, how well backed they are with uh, resources for students and how we conduct conversations and protect minority students, right? And youth in general might play a role then because you're right, the induction period of zero to two months does give us a window for extreme events. The way we hypoth uh, the reason we hypothesize that window in the literature and in psychiatric epidemiology in general is because usually responses start with bad mental health days. Then they escalate into uh, physician visits, emergency department visits, and thereafter into mortality. So that again gives us touch points for, for uh, preventive services. That, that makes sense. Um, um, we only have a couple minutes, but um, there was a question that, that said, is anyone studying conflicts, violence or not, between groups coming into contact with each other when, an, when anti-whatever demonstrators are mobilized? So conflicts within demonstrations, um, profiles on both sides, triggers tactics to help avoid violence. Um, I don't know if Hampton, that's something that you've observed. Uh, yeah, we, so we have a, an internal study that we did at BDI on what we refer to as community response in this scenario. Um, there are a handful of like conclusions that we were able to draw, um, but like nothing that's like super academically rigorous at this point. Um, but just like, uh, I guess with, with that, uh, caveat, one of the things that we found that was really effective at, protecting, for example, um, uh, like drag events or uh, health clinics that provided abortion services um, was a like really intentional and highly networked um, community response. So being able to get people out and just like have um, folks protecting the place from such mobilization uh, was highly correlated with less violence. Um, so Great, thank you, thank you so much. Um, and um, let's thank the the panelists, the presenters for their work. Um, this was really informative and, and great. Um, it's now time for the respondents panel. So um, if the presenters can turn off their cameras and the responders can turn on your cameras. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the thing that is unique about this type of symposium is that we've asked um, people who have experience out in the field um, or experts in this, these particular areas to 
to come and listen to the presenters talk and to um, then just have a conversation with each other or or talk about your experiences um, to, to provide some practical insight into to what they're seeing. And so um, how we'll do this is that um, um, I will take raised hands waving. Um, if somebody is speaking um, and you have something new that you want to add, use your hand raise feature. Um, if you want to comment on what has been said, um, just wave and I'll I'll call on you. And also, if there's a pause, just feel free to, to speak out. So um, who would like to go first? Oh, and the other thing is that um, when you speak for the first time, please introduce yourself so that we'll know where you're coming from. So, so I will call on you. And since Felicia, you're listed first on my list, um, I will call on you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Felicia Brabeck. Uh, I am a state representative in Michigan, uh, and uh, my kind of day job before being a state rep, I'm in my second term, um, and before that was served as a county commissioner for almost a decade, um, but my day job uh, still currently, um, but very much um, reduced, I'm a clinical psychologist, uh, and so kind of bring both of those lenses uh, to this work and uh, uh, just being able to to listen to all of you. Thank you so much for all of your research and um, care with which you're doing all of that from all of these different angles. Uh, some of the things that I, when I, as I was listening and kind of taking some notes, here's what I've I've learned and kind of the, the practice of, um, of of being a member of a legislature. And Annalise, you just asked the question. Um, you know, do folks you know, in their political circles uh, to kind of engender goodwill, as it were. Do they need to pass bills or do they need to just drop those bills? Uh, and I would say that it depends on if you're in the minority or the majority. If you're in the majority, there is an expectation that you actually pass bills. But if you're in the minority, it's the expectation that you drop bills, knowing full well that the majority will block those from happening whichever way it is. So right now, the Democrats are in the majority in Michigan. This has not been the case for decades in terms of having what we call a trifecta. So that means having the, the, the House, the Senate, and the governor's seat. Uh, and so our job has been uh, to pass things like um, increase um, protections for LGBTQ folks, that you know, like increasing our Elliott Larson law, um, you know, looking at education, uh, whether it's sex education, I think Darren was talking about that in, in his um, presentation. Um, the other thing, this was my bill. Um, I Interestingly, we could use this as an example. Um, I had a bill to ban conversion therapy for minors. I introduced it in the minority when we were in the minority because I've served in the minority and the majority. Um, I, I had it in the, dropped it in the minority you know, I didn't get anywhere with it. Couldn't even get a hearing. Couldn't even get anyone to to do anything with it. In the majority, I was able to pass it in the first year, right? You know, and so it's, and, and I will also say that many of these bills, like the bill that I got to pass in, um, now in the majority, people had worked on before I had. Um, but as a psychologist, I can remember moving to Michigan, you know, 20 years ago and being appalled that that was still legal 20 years ago let alone today. Uh, and so um, I think the political landscape very much depends on how you, do you have a messaging, messaging bill or do you have a bill that will actually pass? Um, and that those two look very, very different. Uh, and so, you know, the thing that I kept thinking when I was uh, listening to this again, from my perspective is that elections matter uh, and who is in the seats. I, you know, I can say that I have seen um, even in Michigan, um, a, a rise in um, what I would consider, um, you know, more um, more conservative, more acutely conservative members um, and my colleagues. Um, and and I, I actually can remember after the primary, 
during our last election cycle, talking to one of my Republican colleagues who I'm friendly with um, and, and hearing his concern about the way that his party was going in our state uh, and in the legislature and not being reflected in the legislature. Um, because, you know, even though there's, um, you know, this kind of rhetoric, media rhetoric about there, like we truly try to work together on things. Uh, and, and sometimes um, I have no, well, I have noticed that this session um, there are folks who will just refuse to work on anything. Uh, so that is a, a, a huge change. Um, but I guess I'll stop there right now and let other folks say their 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 insights. Um, Reverend R Russell Meyer, would would you like to share? Uh, well, good morning. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm uh, Reverend Dr. Russell Meyer. I'm a Lutheran pastor. Um, I live in Jacksonville, Florida. The, um, I'm director of the Florida Council of Churches, which is statewide, um, part of the mainline ecumenical movement, uh, composed of the uh, mainline um, and historic Black churches. Um, so I, I, I took some interest um, in um, a mention of the shootings that were here in Jacksonville. Um, earlier this year, and um, reference to our legislative assembly. Um, I do a lot of public policy work. Um, and uh, let me just say, I'm also involved in, an, in a national effort to convene uh, peace, nonviolent, and pro democracy um, groups to, ha to have a kind of meta conversation uh, about. Uh, what it would mean to live in a society beyond violence. So perhaps the, that sort of antidote to what this morning's panel is about. Um, and I've spent a lot of time in the streets uh, with uh, uh, black leaders in Tampa. Uh, uh, we, um, during the George Floyd moment, uh, we had the largest um, uh, public peace um, marches in Tampa, in the state of Florida, and et cetera. So um, uh, just a wealth of on the street and in policy work experience here. Uh, with the failure of our governor's presidential campaign, the political conversation in Florida um, dramatically changed. So the first half of the legislative assembly, we saw a lot of anti-trans bills, and it was very ugly. Uh, um, uh, um, um, but with the collapse of his campaign, um, the president of the Florida Senate said, uh, we're not interested in taking up that stuff. So there was a lot of, um, shall we say, uh, campaign material generated in legislature for those having to run for reelection in the House of Representatives. Um, but it, it served no meaningful purpose for the senators, um, um, since most of them have longer terms and only a third of them are up for change. And, and so we breathe a sigh of relief. Also, um, the major part of the governor's um, so-called stop woke bill or anti-gay bill that was passed last year has been completely... Um, um, uh, defanged by uh, the courts. And uh, just recently, there was a, an agreement signed um, with Equality Florida and um, the administration, et cetera, that severely limits um, the, the repression in the classroom. So um, children of um, queer families can openly speak about their their parents and their and their siblings and et cetera, without any kinds of repercussion, among of other things. Even the governor's pulled back on his anti-book banning and Moms for Liberty that was on the big increase is, is collapsing from the inside uh, because of internal scandals. It, well, funny, the, the leadership turned out to, you know, like to swing the door both ways, if I can put it that way. And, and so um, the, the current conversation in Florida, uh, which I, I'm hoping may be of interest to the whole panel, is that um, the anti-woke agenda 
has simply failed to generate um, um, national movement. Uh, I like to speak of how the presidential campaign uh, was a kind of A-B test and our governor failed it badly. Uh, and the governor of South Carolina for, uh, kind of passed it and et cetera. So uh, the, the long-term prospects there are very different. Uh, let's turn to the shooting in Jacksonville. Um, the, the target of that shooting was um, the oldest historic black college and university in the country, Edward Waters University. Um, and a couple of students ran into the shooter, questioned him, um, uh, called um, the uh, campus security, and he was chased off of campus before the marching band took the field for practice. Um, so it was the intervention of black youth that prevented um, um, further bloodshed on the campus. And so I, I'm very interested in, um, in uh, Dr. Singh's work um, in, in terms of the, how much direct exposure and how much indirect uh, exposure leads to this, uh, the suicide right among black youth. I can tell you from um, my ear to the ground, the, um, the hopelessness in, in the movement um, has, has risen tremendously. It was on the increase going into the pandemic and uh, uh, coming out of the pandemic. There's just a lot of hopelessness um, about uh, any, any kind of effort that would actually sort of change the conditions on the ground. Um, here in Florida anyway. And, and so I'm wondering how, uh, you know, I'm a theologian, so hopelessness is my category that I work with more, uh, more than depression and et cetera. But I'm wondering how that works into um, how you're approaching um, uh, the questions around uh, black youth and their future. And, and so we're looking at ways to create um, experiences of, of hope and purpose um, for the upcoming generations. Um, but I'm very intrigued by the, the correlation she was talking about and the question of intervention along the way and how that works. Thank you so much, Dr. Meyer. I've been thinking about that myself. Um, the, the proposed theoretical mechanisms have to do with the fact that there are direct as well as indirect exposures of these kinds of, uh, you know, events. Um, Dr. Tanksley's work talks about, uh, it's qualitative work, it talks about how um, Black youths who use social media come across these posts over and over again. So there is some algorithmic targeting going on, which I completely believe. Uh, at the national level, empirically, one thing that we might consider doing is to look at Twitter trends in sentiment analysis, search terms, right? News articles maybe, um, and then line those up nationally as well as regionally with psychiatric responses among black youth. Um, I completely agree with you about the idea of hopelessness because that ties directly in with one of the papers that motivated this work and, and my research in general is uh, optimism about the future, which is the other side of hopelessness, right? And uh, Kristen Turney at UC Irvine, she has done uh, a, a huge amount of work on uh, uh, optimism about the future among black youth who are targeted by the police through police stops, through uh, stop and frisk, through searches and general like uh, hyper uh, surveillance and abuse. And that body of work consistently reports that black youth have been exhibiting diminished prospects about the future. That then directly relates to hopelessness. And also by definition, suicides indicate complete absence of future, no future, right? So all of these 
with the idea of hopelessness and optimism or our perspectives about the future, it does come together. Absolutely. Um, yeah, if I can just follow up on that. And the piece that, that we're really taking notice of is that, um, say before the pandemic, if we just use the pandemic as a swinging door of time right now, right? Mm -hmm. um, before the pandemic, uh, the, the place where people found hope um, was we can take our voices to the street, we can, we can exercise First Amendment rights and we'll be heard and change will come. And um, so we can tolerate um, the, the societal abuse we experience from so-called authorities because we still have these First Amendment rights. Uh, what we've seen, at least in Florida, is that no amount of turnout. Uh, March for Our Lives put 10,000 um, students on the streets of Tallahassee and much of the work they were able to get in that moment, as minimal as it was, is being uh, reversed even now. And so um, it, not only do you have this, this kind of sort of individual suppression of human experience happening, when, when uh, young black people try to organize collectively and press their demands, they're finding they're being rejected there. And I think that has increased that, that rejection uh, of their collective experience and collective voice, that rejection has increased their sense of hopelessness. And they talk about that online. So part of the social media stuff is not only being targeted by the outside uh, voices, but it's also their own analysis of nothing that we do individually or collectively is making material change in the prospects of our future. Alicia. I just wanted to follow up on what uh, Reverend Meyer just said. I mean, one of the things that um, I see in the Michigan House is um, the lack of willingness to believe people's experience. Uh, and I mean, we're not unique, right? The, Mich the Michigan House is not unique. I mean, this happens all over the place. Um, but in terms of that translating into being able to put some protections in place, I mean, I have, you know, I have colleagues who will make floor speeches about how things haven't happened and that it's not true. And, you know, and when that makes an impact, right, when you have those are folks who are pushing the same green green button or red button that I am. Uh, and, and so I do think that there is a startling, um, it is always startling to me, not just as a legislator, but also as a psychologist, you know, when I feel like um, one of the things, whether it's being able to do um like race sensitivity trainings, you know, throughout my career, things like that, like, you know, saying over and over again, when someone tells you about their experience, your job is to first believe them, not to say, oh, that can't be true, or you must have misunderstood, or, you know, any, any number of, of things to lessen someone else, and not only as a person, but in their, their life's experience. And I think that adds to the hopelessness. I mean, I can, um, you know, I, I just have vivid memories of, some floor speeches from some of my colleagues and the impact that those had on, on people of color who are legislators as well. And then having those conversations about how that made them feel, um, you know, when they were being told about themselves, basically. Uh, and so I, I do think that that has, you know, I see that every day in terms of the laws that get dropped. Um, and again, you know, we're able to now block some of those, but we're not always in that position. I agree. And I think this is where the role of empirical analyses comes in, is you can argue away individual level experiences, but it's harder to argue away national level data with like rigorous methods um, and not just one, but a body of work, right? Uh, that, yeah. So pushing the needle in whichever way possible, but none of it by itself will ever be sufficient. Thank you. Um, Brad, did you want to chime in? Sure. Um, my name is Brad Bushman. I'm a professor of communication at Ohio State University, and I study aggression and violence. For example, I was a 
member of President Obama's Gun Violence Committee, and I co-chaired two reports on uh, following school shootings, one in Florida, following the one in Florida, the other, the Sandy Hook uh, shooting in Connecticut, and have testified before Congress on youth violence and have devoted my career to try to make this world a more peaceful place. And it's an honor to be included in this conversation. And first, I'd just like to thank all the presenters. I learned so much. I thought all the presentations were excellent. It was especially exciting to hear a new original data. Um, I just have some questions. I, I, ha I have a long list of questions, but I have a question for each presenter. If Is it is it okay to ask? Since, since Dr. Singh is, uh, her camera is already on, you talked about uh, contagion effects. And one of the things I study is the effects of violent media. And there's a strong contagion effect such that after a highly publicized um, murder or suicide, you get copycat um, uh, effects. And I was wondering if you measured media exposure to the white supremacist murders. It would be interesting to include that in your model, yeah. not just the number of white supremacist murders, but how much media attention was devoted to those. That is definitely going to be the next step, right? Uh, media exposure, Twitter exposure. Um, there, so uh, one of the papers that inspired the work that I presented today, they actually went in and looked at this newspaper database with certain key search terms that brought up like what topics got the most coverage. That is one method that we could use. Uh, the, the problem is that to ideally, the best, the best case scenario would be to know what the black youth or yeah. all youth in general are consuming versus, you know, our population in general. Um, I'm sure there are ways to do that. Uh, that is the plan, definitely. Um, and what, in my opinion, just measuring the timing and the numbers of, you know, white supremacist murders of black persons presents a tip of the iceberg. It's not the full iceberg, yeah. right? It has so many layers to it, yeah. Well, I'm really glad to hear that. It, it was just a suggestion uh, to uh, expand your very important work. Um, Dr. Fisher talked about um, um, regulating books describing the Confederacy. Uh, do you have anything to say about just ban banning books in general? Because there's a, a, not only this movement to regulate the content of books, but also just banning books. Do you have anything ab about that? or? Absolutely. One of the things that was really interesting as I was doing the background research for the presentation, things that will be in the subsequent writing that comes out of this rather than the presentation today, is not just about the books that are excluded, but also the books that are forcibly included as well. There was a very standard textbook that was used in the state of Georgia called The History of Georgia that reading through it, it reads like an alternate history, like, sort of like fantasy version of the Civil War and about the history of the United States. So one of the conversations that I think that we need to be having publicly as well is about what's the veracity for the claims that are, that are in these textbooks that are used for children. When it comes to the banning of books, there are some books that are completely and utterly inappropriate for children to read for a variety of different age-appropriate reasons. However, if the reason that something is excluded is because it shows something to be in a negative light or is isn't in line with the political ideology, that's not education to me. And that's one of the things that I think that we can definitely do better across a number of different state legislators is to really be more explicit about, is this a rationale for excluding a book? Is something that's defensible or is something that I would like to do because it's politically expedient or convenient in that sort of way? So having a more nuanced and sort of like a more transparent way of looking about what books are appropriate um, a, that, that are age specific and which ones that we just don't like because we don't like the content. Thank you. Uh, it's really important work. Um, Annalisa talked, uh, I just had a question about um, why do you think anti-trans bills have increased so dramatically in recent years? Do you have any ideas about that? I have other questions too, but that was my <laughs> main one. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, so prior work um, by a couple different um, researchers have kind of looked at political, and these are mostly political scientists, looked at um, trends regarding um, kind of targeting of the LGBTQ population as a whole. Um, and more or less when um, gay marriage became legal in 2015, mm -hmm. the conservative party more or less pivoted to find a new monster. Um, and so a lot of what we're looking at is relating back to that literature that pointed that out and seeing that they've kind of pivoted. And then when abortion didn't work, they pivoted again towards um, transgender individuals. So we think that's why specifically like from, we start seeing it in 2019, but our data focuses on the 2020 to 2023. Um, and maybe we'll expand it to 2024. We're just trying to get whole years in the data set at the moment. So, but Thank that's, you. yeah. You had an impressive list of predictor variables. Wow. It was incredible. And it was also interesting for me as an aggression and violence researcher to see that hate and violence were not associated with the introduction of these anti-LGBTQ plus bills. So we were very surprised by that as well, actually. So yeah, that was not what we thought was going to happen. So it looks like Dr. Meyer has a follow-up. Um... Yeah, my um, question is, um, have you included um, the global movement? Because I think what we're seeing here is not singular. Um, uh, of course, Hungary with Orban, um, Putin and Russia. So there's there's a global movement of nationalism, fascism, um, that is really doubling down on authoritarianism, uh, authoritarianism, and and really pushing um, male-dominated binary relation, you know, 12th century theology and all that sort of stuff. So to what degree does all of that link up as a anti-democracy uh, piece? And, and uh, Reverend Jen Butler, um, who founded Faith and Public Life now has a new movement called Faith and Democracy, and it's got a new book coming out that's really targeting um, this sort of global phenomenon and how it's presenting itself in the US. So thank you so much for that. Um, this work hasn't looked at that. It's been very US specific, um, but a lot of my other research um, is international. Actually, this is one of the only projects I work on that's in the US. Um, <laughs> So that is a very valid point and something I personally would love to look into in the future. And I have the book written down now that you said that um, for my reading list. So thank you. Um, Dr. Stahl, can you say more about why Facebook had strong ties and Twitter or X had weak ties? I thought that was an interesting um, point. Yeah. Yeah. Um... So I'm a I'm a big fan of uh, social network analysis and those kind of yeah. like networked uh, frameworks. So Twitter, um, I think the my read of that uh, Val Valenzuela piece um, is that there is like a broader emphasis on like parasocial kind of relationships on Twitter. Like you're you're following someone that has no idea you're following them. You're um, receiving their information from like directly from a node rather than it being like an edge, like um, you would see on other um, platforms. And then Facebook, because you're it's more group based and it's focused around mutual friendship for the most part. I mean, there's some other tweaks that they've done to the structure there, but um, it's people that you uh, have accepted as like your your friends, your family your neighborhood group. Um, and so those kind of mobilizations, um, it's less about what kind of comes into your feed and more about um, the sort of like trusted influencers who are coming into your feed that you like, at least think you personally know. So I guess in, in both cases, those are potentially parasocial, but the second one is um, more in the framework of already a trusted network, so. Thank you. Our, our own research has shown that violence can spread through social networks. So it's really important work. I think I'm out of time. So. Great. Um, uh, Felicia, I see that you have your hand raised. Do we have time? I actually have a question. Do we have time? Please. Yeah. Oh, okay, great. Um, my question is for Dr. Singh. I had a question about language, right? I, you know, and as a psychologist, it's something that obviously I'm always acutely attuned to and I and I'm assuming as researchers you all are doing I'm not a researcher so sorry I'm so grateful for all of you believe me um, but I have a question about the the way that you ha have um, 
the wording of white supremacist murders of black persons um, and centering the white supremacist rather than black persons murdered by white supremacists. Can you talk to me about that? That's a great change and I will make it. Um... Oh, I, I'm not saying that you have to make it. I was just really curious. <laughs> so in epidemiology, we usually put the exposure before the outcome. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Yeah, that was the thought there is we always uh, like some of my other papers, impact of economic recession on mental health. Right. So the exposure kind of comes first uh, and the uh, the outcome comes later, just the way we write regression models. Um, huh. That's the, that's the only reason. That is really interesting. That is very but interesting. Thank you for, yeah, I, I mean, no one had pointed that out to me until now because, of, <laughs> of course, I'm in my echo chamber of all epidemiologists talking <laughs> methods all day. So uh, that's a great change. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well thank you. I, I literally was like, oh, this is so interesting. I can't wait to hear about this. So thank you for, I, I love learning new things. Thank you. And thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, responders and presenters for these sessions. It was really awesome. And it was great hearing from all of you.